I'm not a motiv motivational speaker, I'm just a designer, and I'm probably, a lot of you in here tonight are designers as well. And yes, the people who haven't seen me for 12 years, I have lost all my hair, and this is not a mole, this is a microphone on my side of my head. Um, Tony Robbins is an amazing motivational speaker. He's charismatic, he's charming, he's convincing, all those C words, and he's cashed up. He has an amazing chin, but... <laughs> What I have over him is he's crap at typography. <laughs> but one of the things we do have in common is a passion for helping people to be the best that they can be. Um, and it's starting with the question, can you design your life? And just out of a curiosity, it's a big, big question. How many people in this room tonight, if I should put your hands up, you don't have to go I like he does, but put your hands up, people who think that they have or have designed their life. Okay, that's quite a few. I can go. <laughs> well, that's quite amazing. So in a room full of designers who design and solve problems for other people, there's quite a few of you, I mean, the majority of you haven't designed your life or you feel you haven't. So I guess your life is just going to fall into place uh, just by accident or someone by kind of divine intervention. But just in case it's not true, how many of you, if I was to ask you individually, how many of you would make some changes in your life, small ones or, you know, big changes? Okay, there's a lot more. So a lot more of you want to improve the quality of your life. I'm not talking about living on a fantasy island, drinking cocktails or winning the lottery. I'm talking about real changes. Although, I mean, that would be nice, obviously. I'm not talking about real changes in your everyday life to make it, to make it better. For what it seems like 85 years, <laughs> I've been designing and redesigning everything but myself. And I think I'm not alone there. I know I'm exaggerating about 85 years, but I think if I added up the hours that I've done, it probably would um, equivalent to that in terms of a working career. So I've done shitloads of work. I've got an amazing team and a thriving business and a wonderful family. But I've never stopped, and probably because I say yes to everything. And all that's great, usually, and I, and I absolutely love it. I can't think of anything that I'd rather do more. But I hit a wall once too many times. I mean, some people close to me call it man flu. Um, but for me, it, it was serious. I thought it was life or death situation. <laughs> it could have been a cold, but anyways. But... <laughs> It made me stop and think about things. It made me think about my life and made me think sh I need to change things. But I was saturated and, and stressed beyond belief. Also eating and drinking too much of, of the wrong things. Another question I want to ask you is, who here tonight uh, has put everything into their career, every ounce of energy, every second of the day? Am I alone here in, that, in, in working that way? Shit, I am. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you guys can help me. <laughs> uh, see, in Australia, everybody put their hands up. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Only last week, I had to apologize to... I got to get 50 of my staff together, and I had to stand in front of them and apologize them for apologizing for being such an asshole for the last few months. Um, so I feel like sometimes I can be a bit of a hypocrite around talking about designing your life, but that's what happens. How many of you kind of avoiding your personal life and, and don't have the energy to focus on what would make your life better, happier, healthier, lighter? Yeah? Okay. Okay. I mean, do other careers have this problem? Do, do butchers have burnout? I wonder. And while I'm on the visuals, I'm going to run the portfolio of work just so people who come here to see some work and not talk about life can get their, can get their fix. All these projects started off as, as a brief, as an opportunity, as a problem to be solved. And they had a timeline, and often it seemed too short, and often there seemed to be no, not enough money. But nonetheless, there was an immovable delivery date. And all these pro projects had to be delivered, and we delivered them on time, uh, no matter what. I realized I was taught to be a designer, but I wasn't taught to be a human being. Now, my parents didn't come tonight, but if they were here, they'd be horrified to hear me say that. I realized that if I didn't do something about my life and start tackling my personal problems, 
as opportunities, then my life would grind to a halt again and again and again. And though this was my biggest realization, my own life, me, is my most important design project. And I didn't even realize that. And I've just said, I've been working for a very long time, over 25 years, which is kind of scary. I talked to someone just now who was 21. Oh, he's 21. And it just put into context to me that, that, that amount of time. So I worked that amount of time without really focusing on my life as a design opportunity or a design project, and I was outsourcing it to all kinds of people. So I realized also that I built an entire business around focusing on other people's problems, around applying creativity to help people and organizations to be the best that they can be. And most importantly, what I realized was that I already had the skills to turn my life around. On top of all that, and because I can't say no, at, at the end of the pro, at that process, I was asked to write a book about it, about everything I'd learned from the process designing my life. But that's this stage three years ago, I didn't know there was going to be a book, and I de definitely didn't think I'd be standing in front of you guys tonight. What I did know, though, was something had to change, and it was time to stop procrastinating. It was time to eat the frog. The biggest thing getting my way was my own procrastination. I spend a lot of time in this messy area. Sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's scary. And it's, and it's a fine line. That's a thick line, actually. But it's a fine line <laughs> and open debate whether how much this procrastination and how much of this is just the creative process. Eat a Live Frog um, is a book by the author Brian Tracy, which I would recommend you read. Another smart guy, but knows nothing about typography. Um, it's a seriously ugly thought, the idea of eating a live frog. I don't know if anyone here has done it. Um, probably less scary for French, the French people here, but um, you would all have a frog that needs eating right now. Um, and if I give you a few seconds to think about it, something that you've been, been avoiding recently because it's kind of hard or difficult, you know, that big thing that if you tackled it, the thing that would make all the difference in your life. But the reality of dealing with it would make you want to go back to bed, at least it would me, and kind of hide from the world. So it was time to eat my frogs, and I had to sit down and get serious about my life and tackle the hard stuff. And so where did I start? I realized that outsourcing to other specialists didn't work, and I tried that for many years. You know, going to a doctor for a uh, prescription or all that kind of stuff, that didn't help me long term. I had to own this once and for all, and I needed to focus on me without distractions. So I started applying what I knew from solving clients' problems in my business. And at Frost Collective, like most design companies, we have a design process, which we developed over the, the years, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's designed to help, people, help us solve our clients' problems with the minimum of pain and the maximum of, of uh, success, and of course, on time. And it's deliberately simple, and it's three easy steps. Learn, think, create. I say easy. It's not easy in terms of once you get into the project, but at least we know what the, the guidelines are for that. Learn is the total absorption page stage, um, and you really need to know what the problem is, the opportunity is in front of you to be able to tackle that. Listening and feeling is critical uh, at this stage as well, as well as using your intuition. To get a full understanding of the problem, you need to look deep into it, not just a surface skim. By questioning everything, you'll eventually find the clues to the solution. And I totally relate to this quote by Tom Dixon. And I used to think, when I was starting off as a designer all those years ago, um, that I had to know, when I meet a client and in, in, in the client's in a certain kind of business, I felt really bad that I didn't understand what their business was, or I didn't understand you know, who's who, et cetera, et cetera. But over time, I realized that I am, have a bad memory, that's true, um, and I find it difficult to retain information. That's why I'm trying to read my script here. But I learned that over time that it, actually having a clean slate in that situation helped me see the opportunity better. It helped me to see the clues that the other people in the organization, in, in, the, in the client side of things, couldn't see. 
a bit of a design detective, really. Every brief comes with parameters. What client ever says, hey, here's a job, here's a project, go away, do whatever you want, charge me whatever you want, and deliver it whenever you want? That might, anyone had that? Um, that kind of project puts me in a spin. In the process of designing my life, I had to figure out what my parameters were. I have a business, I have three teenagers, uh, I live in Sydney, I, I like carbs. Um, <laughs> I'm 50, turning 51 next week, and, I, and that was a real eye-opener for me, because I go, shit, I'm well over halfway. You know, it's no longer this endless time frame that I'm working with. So I'm well over halfway. For example, I have a 12-year-old daughter who thinks I'm an Uber driver. And, <laughs> um, and she's working on controlling me via social media right now. Most of our communication is via Twitter or uh, Facebook, etc. So I was going to change anything. I had to work at what I, what I had in my life. The other option I had was to get bogged down by all, my, all the parameters and all the things I can't do and become a whinger. It never helps to blame anybody or anybody else. There will always be circumstances that feel like they're conspiring against you. There's never a perfect time to make changes. If you wait for that moment, you always blame the world, your kids, your clients, etc. In my case, I finally made the decision to set up and work with what I had. To change my approach from what's not possible to what if I could. This probably doesn't sound like a principle. The other thing I noticed when I applied this, a principle, to, applied this a principle to my life, that like attracts like. I noticed a, differ, a difference in my family, in my, in my business, in the people around me. There was much more positivity, um, and many more opportunities came our way as a result of that. So I learned to take responsibility and learned to say, this one's on me. Blame is lame. It's a bit of fun with typography, you know, I couldn't help myself. Although I, hadn't, I, have, I have nothing but compassion for real victims in this world. But one person that drives me crazy is an excuser, an excuser doesn't take responsibility for the here and now. The excuser relies on external forces to escape responsibility. But it's not an escape, it's a, actually it's a missed opportunity. I was an excuser and, and sometimes today I still have to catch myself. When I was a kid growing up in Canada in the 70s, a bit like talking to you tonight, I was scared shitless. And these exam times would come up, and I would be so fearful of screwing up on my exams that I'd actually not study. And I'd be sitting there watching the news, and you know, sometimes around the world you'd see these hurricane had destroyed a school, or burnt, a school had burnt down. And I was praying for that, praying that to happen to my school. But of course it didn't happen. You set yourself up for excuses by not knowing what you want to achieve, a lack of vision and a lack of focus. The clearer the goal, the more you accept it is a reality. And if you're not committed, if you don't have the faith that you can, you can and will achieve it, then the finish line is never in sight. And how can it be if you don't know where it is? I love this spread. Um, I can see all the faces, all the people that have said these different things over time. And, you know, there's times in, in the business, it will be in any design business, where people go, it's not my job, um, there's not enough budget, the client's an asshole, uh, there's not enough time, it's boring, uh, I wasn't briefed properly, etc. On a personal level, you know, I've got someone in my business who's a Gemini, and one day she's this, and the next day she's that, and she's constantly using that as an excuse. I'm on the cusp. Um, <laughs> I have big bones. Or it wasn't me, or my son often says after a soccer game, it was the ref's fault, um, which is always uh, a good one. And they go on and on. So I looked at the problem, and I checked my, my resources, and I got clear and decided to take full responsibility, just like a client project. The next step was to think about strategic solutions. I found it really works for me to be open. Have an open mind on what you don't know. Be open to un the unknown, and, and unknown being exciting and revealing. Don't close doors 
or go to the familiar route or jump to immediate conclusions. One example that I had, whether, you know, whether it be open or closed, was when uh, Jonathan Newhouse from Condé Nast approached me. This is like in 2000. And he approached me about a choice of going to Japan for, to become Japanese art director for Japanese Vogue or Russia. And I, I chose uh, Japan. Um, totally out of the blue. I had no idea where it came from. It was quite funny. But I was totally flattered by that opportunity. I didn't hesitate to say yes. The first class flights uh, from London with from my, me and my young family, a beautiful apartment, a clothing allowance. Uh, we felt special, although my suit jacket sort of up to here. Everything was so new and different than anything I had experienced before. Experiencing Japanese culture was a real eye opener and beautiful people, incredible respect and pride in everything that they do. It was incredibly exciting until I started the job. The office was not what you expect from uh, Vogue. It was, the walls were similar color to this, the desks were similar color to this, and it was very, very difficult. <laughs> I didn't speak Japanese, I didn't understand Japanese language or typography, and you know, for the magazine, rather than going from left to right, the stories went from right to left. So I needed to kind of do a quick kind of recce and try to find someone out there to help me learn about Japanese typography, which, which I did. For me, it just looked like body copy or blurb, you know. I wasn't outside my comfort zone. I didn't have a comfort zone. I never experienced anything like this before. I remember going on shoots in the middle of the forest um, with, with all this amazing crew, and at the time I was smoking, chain-smoking crazily, and I was just thinking, I know nothing about fashion. As you, as you can tell. <laughs> I just think, why on earth did I say yes to this? Um, I still don't know why. Anyways, after about eight months, I got fired. It's not totally my fault, um, but I'm sure I had something to do with it. But the magazine was delayed time and time again. Um, it was really... I didn't, I'd be in meetings for, with about 20 people for about two hours all in Japanese, and at the end of it, I'd say, what do they talk about? And they'd say, my translator would say, oh, nothing really important, you don't need to know. So <laughs> that was a disaster, because I didn't, I wasn't, I just wasn't, I wasn't there. I was there physically, I was a designer, probably. I could lay it out, but I couldn't um, do much more than that. So I felt terrible, I felt like I failed. I truly failed. Once I got over it, I realized that nothing ever again could be as difficult or as humiliate, humiliating as that, uh, hopefully. In fact, it made, made me stronger as a result of that. And thankfully, I could come back to London, back to my studio, back to my comfort zone, and back to where I felt, uh, you know, I could understand things. Stepping outside your comfort zone, I think, is a good thing, and people talk about that a lot. You know, it, it's, it, it's challenging, but it'll take you to new places like that example, and it could have worked out. But I seriously advise, when, you, when you're stepping out of your comfort zone or doing something similar like that, do some research first and, and make, before you commit to a major project like that. Stretching yourself beyond your comfort zone will grow your mind and possibly lose your hair, and that's my reason here. But apparently there's stuff that you can get that, uh, that I need to look into. Frank told me about that yesterday. Thanks, Frank. He said, it's too late, mate. <laughs> I'll just have a big Bozo, um, Bozo the Clown kind of hairdo. Um, push yourself in life, but don't break yourself. Um, you know, I've certainly felt at times I get very close to kind of breaking myself, and you need to be very mindful of that. Know your limits. And another word of advice is to get everything in writing. I love this quote. It's a bit of reverse psychology, um, to avoid criticism, say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. These quotes helped me design the book really quickly because it, these are big words, and I kind of, you know, in an afternoon, <laughs> in an afternoon, I did half the book, um, which was which was great. This quote changed how I look at things in a big way. Rather than trying to be perfect with everything you do, focus on learning from your mistakes. And it's okay to make mistakes. I used to think it wasn't okay to make mistakes. Um, I don't know if you guys put the same pressure on yourselves, but 
Be agile and don't get stuck. Keep pushing through. Just try stuff rather than procrastinate. Probably like most designers, I started off at a very young age. In fact, my design school taught me to be independent, taught me to think of ideas by myself. And now things have changed. People are, and we're doing so much more around design thinking and workshops and all that kind of stuff. But I used to think that I had to have the best idea. And today, I don't care where the idea comes from as long as it's, a, it's, it's the best idea. It's a great idea, an appropriate idea. And you can get stuck by yourself and lose confidence and momentum and start spinning, spinning wheels. Other people fill in the gaps and, and more, much more. You need to bring other people into your life to make it full, to fulfill your potential. Identify your support uh, team at work and in your personal life. Now, this is a good one, be fit or, oops, or be fittish. This is kind of, this is a kind of a word I made up. Um, you know, it's, it's less uh, scary, the idea. Um, slightly less pressure and, and much more achievable. Design needs to be sustainable, and, and the body is a piece of design, an amazing piece of design. And when it's functioning better, it makes life easier. I know it's not simple. We all put a lot of crap in our bodies, smoking, fast food, alcohol, etc. Being bad is actually easy. Exercise, eating healthy, uh, is, and being good is, is, is relatively hard, I find. People tend to binge on, on well-being and... Uh, don't train or live for ongoing well-being because it's, it's quite difficult. Find a, a balance between your everyday life, your family and your career and your health and design yourself a more sustainable body as it will last longer. And did you know your stomach is actually the size of your fist? It was interesting. For a long time I think I was putting my hand up here, which was a mistake, but the idea is that you eat your meal should be the size of your fist as opposed to these huge portions that we get uh, in restaurants and stuff. It's a fascinating fact and kind of a, it's an easy reminder to kind of think of it graphically when you have a, have a meal. And did you know while we're at it, um, a bottle of wine, I thought it was a glass of wine, but a bottle of wine is equivalent of nine slices of bread. Hi hey guys. Um, like nine slices of bread. I mean I was drinking loads. I was drinking a bottle a night, sometimes two bottles a night to myself, which was scary. Anyone else do that here? There's more hands? There's no more hands. Okay, I'm alone again on that one. Maybe it's beer. Ten pints of beer, maybe? Oh, you're into bread, yeah. But I started thinking about these things graphically, and I'm thinking, wow, I can't eat, I can't drink all that. And I realized then kind of the difference it made for me when I started to, to reduce that. In fact, now I don't drink at all. I haven't drank for three years, and I feel fantastic for that. I'd also do things like I would binge train, you know, I'd, I would have a holiday coming up and I'd go, shit, got two weeks to get in shape and go to the gym and of course it didn't work, you know, I'd spend the whole holiday in a t-shirt sitting by the pool. Uh, <laughs> but I think the key thing is to kind of start moving, that helps, you know, move around, I'm doing a bit of it now, I'm losing calories, burning calories, but I started kind of getting up at five in the morning and go for... Um, a walk. I kind of st stole an hour from my sleep. We also we consume way too much. You know, we, there's too much in our lives, um, physical and food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that interesting. Some of these affirmations are kind of influenced. You know, the top, which came first, the typography idea or the affirmation? But I think be mindful that everything you purchase. Make sure that you kind of what you buy is. Um, you think about, do you really need that in your life, you know? Pace yourself. You know, this, is, this spread was just an easy one. It's a bit of typography fun. But more seriously, pace yourself in life and listen to yourself and listen to your body. Feel what works for you. I'm just going back to those, the walking and talking and stuff. When I, went, when I was designing this book, I started to go out every morning at, at 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, as I said, I kind of stole an hour that I didn't have. And I go to Centennial Park in Sydney near my house, and I go for a, an hour walk. And I would walk with, by myself or with friends or with a client, and it was amazing. It was just, you felt fantastic. And 
the conversation flowed and ideas flowed. And I don't know why, but I find when I'm walking around, I'm far more productive, uh, apart from tonight, I'm far more productive in, you know, things flow naturally. Um, I'm, and there's much more clarity with that. The st third step in the design process is, is to create. And once the problem has been identified, and we have lots of ideas on, on how to tackle it, we need to get out there in the real world and start to action it. Same with clients. Once you bring an idea into the real world, it's not always right first off, and you need to keep tweaking it until it um, works most effect effectively. You can do this by designing by failure. I mean, don't, don't give up. Focus on constantly tweaking and improving your ideas. Don't expect them to be perfect from the beginning, and perfection can be intimidating, and it can stop you in your tracks, which happens to me a lot. Just bloody start and get your ideas down and, and live with it and, and tweak it. You can always come back to it or let it go, um, and if, if it's a mistake, you can, you can learn from it. And as I said before, just don't repeat the same mistakes. Key thing is to be decisive, which is a very hard thing to do. You can save yourself a lot of time and energy by making mistakes you could have avoided by aligning yourself with someone who has got to where you want to be. A form of leapfrogging. Look out for someone who is your hero figure, someone who inspires you, and helps give clarity to complex situations. Having a range of, of mentors is very helpful. Um, I've got a financial advisor, a naturopath, uh, a life coach, a speech coach, God forbid. <laughs> She's, she'll be cringing. I'm not doing what she told me to do. I tell you, I try to memorize this, and it's so bloody hard. I flew from Sydney on Saturday, I got here, went to, my, went to my hotel room after I saw my parents, went through it, it was 15 minutes. I go, oh my God, I've got to make this thing 45 minutes. I don't know how I'm doing now. I'm already on an hour. It can't be an hour already, is it? Bloody hell. Um, so it's a form of leapfrogging. Look for someone who's a hero figure. Um, having this kind of support really helps you make the best moves in life and creating the best strategy for you. After leaving college down in Worthing in West Sussex, um, I can't remember when it was, 80-something or other, 89. I knew I had to go work in the best place in London. I didn't even, I don't think I ever went to London until, until then. So I found Pentagram. I, I got in there to the back door through um, um, a friend that had worked there. And I was lucky enough to be taken on by a great guy, John Rushworth, as one of the partners at Pentagram. Now that, working at Pentagram tr changed my life. It really did in a huge way. It opened my mind, and I got so much experience in, in a very short period of time. I was amazed at, at the time, Alan Fletcher, who's sadly no longer with us. It was a big open plan studio, it still is, hasn't changed. And it was, it was amazing. I'd be sitting there working away, and I'd be looking at all the partners, you know, watching them, uh, what they do. And I was fascinated by Alan Fletcher and, and his work. The guy was a genius. And he was in his 70s, he had beautifully ironed jeans, um, he smoked like a chimney in the studio at that time, and he was gruff as hell. But his work was effortless, and always a clever idea in every project. And I wanted to be like him, and I wanted to understand uh, what, it, what he was thinking, and what were the reasons why he did what he did, and how to have ideas. I mean, at the time, I didn't even know how to have an idea and know when an idea is right. I was lucky enough to have the odd glass of wine with him, and, and, uh, which, I, which I cherished. Another partner was Kenneth Grange, um, who was in his 60s or 50s at the time, I think, and he was kind of the Mark Newson of his, of his time. It seems he didn't like me, and he often looked at me very suspiciously, probably because he caught me staring at him all the time. <laughs> And he seemed, he's not, you're not here tonight, are you, are you Ken? <laughs> he's a great guy. He seemed like he was always in a bad mood. <laughs> he was always in a bad mood and he was always rushing around. Uh, I guess he was just very, very busy. And running a business can be very hard. 
And one night after working for three nights in a row, three day, days and nights in a row, thank you, John, for that experience, I was desperately tired, and, and Kenneth had, around the back of his little area where he sat, he had this chaise lounge, as they say, um, and I just thought, I'm just going to lie down for a second, just a second, and I lied down, and I was woken by a very angry bear in the early hours, in, uh, about 8 o'clock in the morning, going, what the fuck are you doing in my chair? So what it taught me was that how I don't want to be. Um, that's kind of why I apologized to my staff last week. Seek help. I'm always looking for help. <laughs> uh, I need help now. Um, <laughs> I'm always looking for advice because, I mean, you just, you know, it's good to connect with people. It's good to ask advice. It's good to kind of help kind of find solutions. Um, and I met with um, one of the partners of the partners, um, David, uh, God, maybe 20 years ago, and he said to me, the biggest realization he had was not to, he realized you don't have to be good at everything. And that's something that, um, I don't know about you, but I was always trying to be good at everything that I did, you know, whether it's accounts or whether it's getting business or design or typography or PR, whatever it was. And it's okay to ask for help and kind of find other people to help you, uh, guide you. I think it's important to, to yearn to learn. I think it's really important to, more important is actually to be focused on what you want to learn. Don't just learn things for the sake of it. Learn something. Involve, it, it, put the energy into learning something that you really want to, um, to do, and you will, will succeed with that. And you can learn from your mistakes, but it's also better to avoid mistakes altogether. Um, but with advice of the mentor, it's better to avoid, you know, any kind of catastrophe kind of, or whatever. Life is messy. And I want you to be the best that you can be. And if, if somehow, out of this talk or reading my book, I can help one of you, then that's been worthwhile for me. Life is wonderful, but it, as I said, it can get messy. I just want to recap on the three-step process, which I went through previously, just because it might um, help you in your life. And probably a lot of you designers have experienced this and use this in, in your everyday. Some of the talks I do are you know, mostly not designers in those. But the learn is kind of get clear on your parameters, get a good brief, dig deep and question everything and listen for clues. And think is surround yourself with others and who care about you, your success and be open to new ideas. Eat the frog and tackle the hard stuff. Create. Getting out there in the real world to see how your ideas stack up. Keep adjusting, design by failure. Get yourself great mentors or stalk somebody like I did. Even when you've done all this, things change as life is messy. Contrary to many business coaches, and everybody I speak to when I ask advice about design or business or anything like that, everybody tells me that I should say no. Um, my kids don't tell me that. Um, but I found saying yes is far more powerful because it opens up opportunities. Now, you can get inundated by that stuff, but the fact is it's quite incredible when you say yes, the, it opens up, opens doors. I mean, if you say no to something, it closes doors. And it can close one door, it can close ten doors, it can close thousands of doors. And I look at where I am today in my career and, in, in, and where I am in terms of our, our work, I can look at the portfolio and the projects and I can see how they're all connected. They all go back to the very beginning, to Pentagram, to my design school, to being a kid. You know, it's all connected. So if I'd said no to things, and I did say no to some things along the way, of course, but if I said more, no more often in the past, why, who knows what would happen, but I think what would happen would have been less abundance of opportunities um, for me to, to tackle. And that's important. You know, without opportunities, we're out of business. Even if you're, if you're one person and you don't have any opportunities, you're out of business. If you're 50 people like I have, I've, it's important for me to keep that flow and the, and the doors um, opening and to create that positive kind of uh, approach to what we do. I think it's important that you embrace messiness. And, you know, I think also what's important is that 
Um, you know, people can be very money focused, and, and yes, you need to make money, but I work with a lot of organizations who don't have money. I work with a lot of charities, a lot of cultural institutions, startups, etc. I believe what they're doing is adding positive contribution to society, and I really believe it's important that I can help them be the best they can be. Just because they don't have the, the funds that a big bank would have, um, doesn't mean that they're not, they're not, there's not an opportunity for them to be successful. So whether it's, um, as I said, a cultural institution or working right across society, I think it's really important to have that approach. I was a stone heavier two months ago when I said, yes, can you believe it? I look like I'm, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's like my, a joke for myself. Um, and it just kind of proves that I, I you know, I've written a book about designing a life. There's a lot of great things, the things you can do, a lot of great positive things that make a big difference to your life. And I'm still screwing up. I'm still slipping off to, um, you know, exercising as much as I should, etc. I'm not drinking. I'm not drinking coffee. I'm doing a lot of eating well and all that kind of stuff. But it's, you know, it's okay. Um, I had to reset myself, having committed to coming here, um, and I had a, which gave me a goal to work for. Just see my abs. No. Um, it was a saying, it was the act of saying yes that kind of got me refocused. I mean, take the pressure off you and remember that designing a life isn't about certainty. Designing a life isn't about permanence. It's about incremental change for the better with even the odd relapse. Back to this point, and if I leave you with anything, it's that your life is the most important design project that you'll ever have. So treat with the priority and respect and time and investment as it deserves. Um, so my book is kind of the legacy of the journey I've been on, and it covers many more principles and many more. I've got great interviews of some amazing people that have inspired me. I'm going to kind of finish with the promise that designing life is possible, and although not easy. And this book won't solve your problems. You have to do that yourself. And it'll take a lot of hard work but I believe it will inspire you to work better and living better. And good luck, and may the design force be with you.